Our next speaker is Mary Odros from your University of Cambridge. Uh, he will tell us something about the entropy power equality for QDs. So thanks everybody for sticking around for the last talk. Um, so this is joint work with Nilanjana from Cambridge and from, with Conrad from Real Hallway and Ghent. So this will be mostly about information theory, but at the end of my talk, I will talk about some extensions and possible applications in some other directions. All right, so the problem that I want to talk about Roughly speaking, is we have the following setup. We have a channel which has an input, which I don't know by X, and then it has some noise that's added on top of this input. And so we have access to this. We can put anything we want here, but also there's some kind of intrinsic to the channel, there's some noise that we cannot control. It just always gets added to the input. So, and then you can imagine there's some sort of a switch here that's set in a certain position. So if it's set like this, then this is just a perfect channel. It just uh, spits out the perfectly whatever was put inside here. Or if it's set the other way, then we, whatever we put in, it just gets completely lost. And what we get out as an output is just pure noise. But uh, like in more general uh, case, you can imagine that there is a certain parameter lambda, which basically says how much of the signal gets through. And then I will denote, I will use this box uh, symbol here to denote the output. So this is basically intuitively what it means is that this noise is added on top of the input, and, and lambda just says how much of the input is still there. All right, so now uh, one simple question you might ask is how noisy is this output? So basically you can ask what's the entropy of this output? And it's reasonable to, to, to believe that there might be some, some, some sort of bound like this, basically because as we change this lambda, we interpolate between this input and pure noise, and so presumably, if we change this lambda and compute entropy, we, we would somehow interpolate between the entropy of the input and the entropy of the noise. So that's very kind of believable conjecture. And inequalities of this form, they, these are basically, I, I will, in this talk, I will call them entropy power inequalities. Maybe it's a strange name, but uh, you'll see later uh, where it comes from. All right, so, so now, in my talk, I will discuss uh, three diff different setups where you can consider these kinds of inequalities. And I will uh, explain uh, how these inequalities look like. And I will discuss them in this order. So basically, there are, there are two modes you can consider. You can work with continuous variables and discrete variables, or you can work with classical systems or quantum systems. And so there, somehow in this case, there is no nice analog of these inequalities, but in all the other three cases there are. And, and our contribution is to to obtain these inequalities in this uh, particular case. And so originally, they were first uh, conjectured actually by Shannon in his uh, paper for continuous variable quantum uh, distributions. Then uh, just very recently, uh, they were generalized, uh, these inequalities, to quantum case, also for continuous variable quantum states uh, by Koenig and Smith. And so what we have is, uh, in our work, is a, a discrete version, which are, by discrete I mean a finite dimensional analog. So it's for, for QDIS, like d-dimensional systems. Okay, so as I said, these inequalities essentially look of this sort. So these uh, here, rho and sigma, are uh, either quantum states or uh, dis uh, distributions in a classical case. And so very vaguely, you can think of this as uh, sort of saying that this function f is concave under this uh, strange addition rule. Okay, so, so yeah, so these are, uh, these are states of distributions, and this is some kind of entropic function, and typically it's going to be either just entropy or uh, entropy power, which is e to the some constant times entropy. And well, the name entropy power sort of it has a dual meaning. It's, this is literally the power of entropy, but there is another reason why it's called entropy power. But okay, anyway, that's not too important. And then this, there is some sort of operation that interplays between these two uh, states of distributions. I and mean, in all these three cases, this operation is, uh, is something completely different. So in this uh, classical continuous variable case, it's based on convolution. Then in Koenig and Smith's work, it's based on a beam splitter. And in our work, it's based on something uh, that I'll call partial swap operation. And so even though I'm using the same symbol to denote these three operations, they are actually not related in any obvious way, but just sort of in some intuitive sense. So it just corresponds to somehow adding noise on top of your signal. All right, so, so let's start with the classical entropy power inequalities. 
So this is for uh, continuous variable uh, distributions. And so basically, uh, you can think of this distribution as some kind of function looks like this. So for every real number, it uh, gives you some uh, non-negative uh, number from 0 to infinity, and it has to be normalized. Now, what's interesting about this is that this r to the d, so here is just a r, but in general, it could be over r to the d. So this is a vector space. So then you can do some operations on these variables in this form. You can multiply them by some constant. So for example, if you multiply x by 2, then what's going to happen is that, so if this is peaked at 1, it's going to be peaked at 2 now, but it's going to also spread out because it has to be normalized. So somehow, so the, the, you can scale this, uh, this uh, probability density function by multiplying by constant. But also, since it's a vector space, you can add them together. So if you have one uh, variable of this sort and another one, you can add them together. And then the probability density function for, uh, for this uh, sum is just a convolution of the two density functions. So if it, uh, one of them looks like this, another looks with, like this with two peaks, then we get something like this. So it's a very kind of natural way of, of combining uh, distributions together. OK, so now if you use this scaling and addition together, you can define something I'm just going to call scaled addition. And this is one instance of this box operation. So as you can see, if you change lambda from 0 to 1, it interpolates in a certain way between x and y. And at the extreme points, you get either one or the other distribution. And so what uh, Shannon uh, conjectured was the uh, conjecture inequality of this, uh, of this sort, where uh, I guess originally he conjectured for this function, uh, so e to the 2 times entropy divided by d, so d is the dimension of these variables, so they are over a uh, real space of d dimensions. And actually it was uh, later shown that uh, it, this inequality for this function is equivalent for just for entropy. And, uh, uh, okay, so then it was proved uh, some years later uh, in increasing standard of rigor in, uh, in these two papers uh, using constant concepts like Fisher information and De Bruyne's identity. But I'm not going to explain what it is. It's not going to be important for the talk. And so what's, what's important is that the inequalities of this form, they have uh, lots of applications. So just to mention a few is you can uh, bound channel capacities, and you can even do things like strengthening the central limit theorem, which is, seems like nothing to do with communication and channels. All right, so that's the, that's the classical case. So now, what is the quantum entropy power inequality, which was obtained by Cunningham and Smith? So that's also for a continuous variable, in this case, the quantum states. So basically, to just to state this inequality, you first have to say what is the operation of how you combine states. So remember, we had this scaled addition to combine distributions. And so we need some kind of way of combining uh, quantum states. And then what uh, Cunningham and Smith proposed is just to use beam splitter. So basically, you can think of the shining some laser. Uh, so there's one uh, quantum state is describing the laser that's coming here. And there's another one describing the laser coming here. And then somehow they go through this beam, so they don't come out. And well, if you want to describe it formally, then you use a, a two by two entry matrix, and you say this is how it acts on these annihilation operators. But it, it's not too important what exactly what, what this all means. But so basically, uh, then. To define this uh, additional operation, you can write uh, this beam splitter like this, so a linear combination of identity, which means just uh, transmitting, and x, which means kind of swapping the two things around. And then for every uh, the two by two matrix like this, there is a big infinite dimensional matrix acting on Hilbert space of these uh, of two, two incoming modes uh, that describes how these states are transformed. And then the output is just given by uh, you take this uh, product state of row 1, row 2, and you just conjugate it by the symmetry. So that's, I mean, it's a very vague description of how this beam center works. OK. So, and also you can see that this uh, kind of, in a very uh, vague sense, looks like the scaled addition. We multiply by square root of lambda, and we just have this i here. But kind of very hand-waving uh, way, it looks very similar. OK, so now to, to define what is this box operation for quantum states, you basically just run them through this beam splitter, and then you throw out the second system. So there's something that comes out in the first output, and that's the, the combined state. And again, as you interpolate this lambda from 0 to 1, it changes the transmissivity of the beam splitter. And then if everything is transmitted, then this uh, state goes in garbage. And otherwise, it gets, uh, if, if, if it's completely reflective, then this gets reflected and gets out, out here. So you can interplay between two states. 
And so the uh, entropy power inequality that, uh, that was proved by Cunning and Smith and then uh, slightly generalized by, by these other people, again, it looks of this form. It's sort of like concavity with respect to this, uh, this box uh, operation. And it was proved for these, uh, these two functions. And in this case, they, these two cases, these, uh, it's not known to be equivalent for them. These two cases are kind of uh, different. Uh, okay, and, and D here is the number of modes. Um, for, for each of these uh, lasers, there could be several modes. And uh, so just to stress again that this box operation, so you shouldn't think of this as a generalization of the classical one. It's just, it's a, it's a different box operation. It just intuitively is kind of, uh, it has some intuitive uh, correspondence, but it's not in any uh, mathematical sense a generalization of the classical case. And, but, but nevertheless, the proof is very similar to the classical case. So it just, uh, it uses uh, generalizations of these concepts uh, of Fisher information on the Bruin identity. All right, so now to, to explain what our contribution is, uh, again, what we need to first do is we need to define some way of, of combining quantum states that would interpolate between the two states. And well, the, the most trivial way of doing this is just say, well, just take convex combination of the two states. But then basically, there, it's, it's just not interesting. There's nothing to prove in that case. So we, we, we needed to come up some, with something that's, um, that's uh, slightly more interesting. And what we propose is this uh, partial swap operation. So to define what it is, so just a regular swap is, uh, just acts like this. So if we have two d-dimensional uh, systems, then they just get swapped around. And so one interesting observation you can make, so if we want to interpolate between swapping and not swapping, kind of like the beam splitter between transmitting and reflecting, what we need is somehow to continuously swap things around. So, and what you can observe is S is actually, uh, since if you apply the swap twice, you just get identity. So it means this is uh, the eigenvalues of the swap are plus minus one. So it's uh, Hermitian, and you could use it as a Hamiltonian. It's not too hard to check that. If you uh, use it as a Hamiltonian, you get the following unitary matrix. And so then, uh, well, just changing the parameters, it's fairly natural to define this partial swap to be this. So it's a linear combination of identity and swap, and there is some parameter lambda that interpolates between the two, and you can check that this is always unitary for, for all choices of, of lambda. And then, similarly, in what uh, Cunning and Smith did, it's, you, we use the same idea that, so you just take these two states uh, as, a, as a product input, you apply this partial swap, and then you throw the second system away. And it's not too hard to work out uh, using some graphical notation that uh, this is the output state. So this is a, so now you can see that this is, it looks kind of like a convex combination of the two input states, but then there is this extra term, which if the two states don't commute, ma makes things more interesting, okay? And, um, so this is going to be our uh, operation, of, uh, this, this box operation of combining the states. And just uh, an interesting observation, which if I have time, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it, more about this. But this actually, this operation has been used in quantum algorithms. And actually on Monday, the first two talks, they both mentioned this uh, result of, uh, of Lloyd, uh, Moxeni, and Revintrost. Uh, and if I have time, I'll explain uh, how, how it's related. Okay, so just to state our main result is basically we prove an equality of the same form. We prove that for any uh, function, so here it's uh, more general than, than the previous results which were for specific functions. So we have a, a class of functions that are concave and symmetric from, uh, from cuted states to just real numbers. And all these functions obey this sort of uh, concavity-like uh, relationship. Uh, and so just so what the concave symmetric is, the concave just means this, so the function intuitively looks like this. And symmetric means just it depends only on the eigenvalues of the state and is symmetric in the eigenvalues. So a typical example, again, of this, this sort of function is just entropy of the state. So entropy is well known to be uh, concave, and it's also symmetric. It's just the, it's the, you compute the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues. Okay. Okay, so that's the main result. Uh, so now I'll just briefly give you the the ingredients that go into the proof. So again, so that this is what we want to prove. So it's sort of like concavity of this um, of this uh, uh, function with respect to this uh, strange operation. And the main tool in, in our proof is majorization. So uh, I'm not going to define formally what it is, but basically two vectors, uh, one of them majorizes the other one. If you take partial sums of components of the vectors, and there are certain inequalities between them. And so, so imagine that we could show the following uh, majorization uh, inequality, that the spectrum of this uh, combined state 
is majorized by convex combination on the spectrum of, of the two states. So if so, the, actually, the, most of the technical work goes into proving this. And once you prove this, then getting this is very straightforward. So I'm just going to show how it works. So now, so this is a convex combination of spectra of two states. But so you might as well just diagonalize the states and then take convex combination and then compute the spectrum. So instead of computing convex, uh, convex combination of the spectra, you compute the spectrum of a convex combination of the diagonal versions of the states. So this uh, is obvious inequality, the obvious equality. And now, uh, this, the, the most important property of this majorization is something called sure concavity. So basically, if you have any function that's uh, symmetric and concave, if this, uh, if this uh, majorization holds, then you immediately get this, uh, this inequality. And this is very similar to what we want. We just need to apply two very simple steps. So we just uh, need to pull out these lambdas just using concavity, which is one of the uh, properties we assume. And then we just go back to the basis where these states were originally. So, they, so these tilde ones are diagonal, and these ones are the, in whatever basis they are. They don't have to be uh, diagonal on the same basis. So that's the kind of the, well, a toy version of the proof. But I mean, the, all the work goes into proving this. And that's, uh, not, that's not trivial, and I, I don't have time to explain that. OK, so now, so what are in interesting functions that are symmetric and concave? So again, uh, entropy is, uh, is a classical example, a very, very well-known example. But also entropy power, which uh, you can uh, need to uh, some constant times entropy. And there's another function uh, which uh, has this strange name, entropy photon number, which, which looks like this. Uh, so it's the entropy times some constant, and then you apply some strange g inverse function. So well, what is this entropy photon number, and why, why do we care about it? So the, this entropy photon number is uh, it's basically this. So, so if you deal with these continuous variable states, you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, and there are certain states that are called thermal states. So a thermal state with n photons looks like this. And so it's just a diagonal state in this, uh, this infinite, uh, infinitely big diagonal matrix. And if you compute the entropy of this state, then uh, it's, it's uh, as a function of this photon number, this parameter n, you get uh, this, uh, this uh, strange expression. And now you can say, OK, so if we have a state that's not a state of this form, but some other state, we can just say, we want to say what's the number of photons in some other state. We can just say, uh, we can just use this, uh, this sort of expression. So we can basically, we can, we can just define a photon number of any state to be uh, in a way such that it's consistent with, the, with this, uh, this equation. So it's just the average number of photons in a thermal state that has the same entropy uh, as the given state. And so this definition, it's, it's very meaningful in, uh, in, in this uh, case of infinite dimensions, but you can just use the same definition also for, for qubits, for finite dimensional states. So then it doesn't have this interpretation as a as number of photons, but at least mathematically it, it looks the same. And so uh, to just uh, show uh, like a summary of all these inequalities that, that are known up to now, is, uh, so there are these uh, three cases, uh, so continuous variable, quantum and classical, and then uh, quantum uh, discrete, so which is the one that we, uh, we are working with. So this, for the function h, the inequality has been shown in all cases, so for entropy power, it's, it's uh, particularly interesting for these values of the constant c uh, in these cases, and we show for a large uh, range of constants, which in particular contains the, these two. And this entropy photon number inequality, however, it has been only conjectured for these uh, for, quantum, uh, for for continuous quantum, variable quantum states. And so, in our case, all we need to do is just show that this uh, function for this uh, value of c, or for some range of values of c, is concave. And if we show that, we immediately get a kind of a, a qubit analog of this photon number inequality. Okay. So now. Um, so that's the summary of, of so, so these are our results, but this is just how it fit, fits into the bigger picture. And I guess the, the, the motivation for this work was basically that this inequality is, uh, is conjectured in this setting, and it's interesting that we can actually show some kind of analog of it for, for finite dimensions. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, so any questions about uh, what, the, what the result is? All right, so, uh, so I'm going to talk briefly now about applications. And um, so, OK, so, so the application we have is in some sense a little bit contrived because so we can say something about a channel that looks exactly like the operation that we cooked up in the first place. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's, a, well, it's a non trivial uh, result. So I'll just, show, I'll just show how you can use this sort of inequality. And it's also 
in a similar way it has been used uh, in a classical case and also in the uh, uh, continuous variable point case. So, so we, we're going to consider channels of this form. So we put in some state row. And so this is the this, this, this gray box is a long channel. And it has two parameters, this lambda, which says how much of the state it gets through, and sigma, which is the, some kind of state that's prepared within the channel. So what the channel does, it just prepares this sigma, then it partially swaps the sigma and rho, and then throws the system away, and it gets this, this, this box uh, thing out. So this is a valid, uh, this is a valid form of the channel. It's basically the sign screen dilation of this channel. So now, uh, what's, uh, so you can ask what is the uh, classical capacity for, for, for this sort of channel with, with, with some parameters, lambda and, uh, and sigma. And so, so uh, well, in, in particular, there is a, a slight variation of this classical capacity uh, question. You can uh, demand that the, uh, the inputs over many uses of the channel, so if you remember Debbie's talk, they have to be a uh, product, uh, product with, with respect to each other. So, then the, the capacity in such, in such case is given by something called Holeva quantity, which is just uh, this, um, uh, this optimization problem over uh, probability distributions and quantum states, and then the entropy of uh, convex combination of the outputs, and then a com minus convex combination of the entropies uh, of the outputs like this. And so, so if we want to upper bound this quantity, so first we can just replace this, whatever entropy of, of whatever state this is, we can just replace by a log of the dimension of the output system, which is just D in our case. And then if we want to upper bound second term, we can just, so we don't know this is just a convex combination of entropies of a bunch of output states, but we can always bound this by the minimum output entropy. So this we just minimize over all states and the entropy of, of, of all possible outputs that you can get in, from this channel. So this is a true way of, of bounding things, but now the question is, can we evaluate this minimum output entropy for this particular channel? Uh, and so, and that's exactly where we can use our inequality. So basically, the the, the output entropy of the channel is just the entropy of this this uh, these com combined state. And then, because of the entropy uh, power inequality, it sort of behaves like concavity. So we get this uh, convex combination of these entropies of these two states. And then, if we are minimizing this output entropy, we can just plug in a um, pure state, in which case this is going to be zero. And then we get this uh, very simple uh, lower bound. And now if we plug in this lower bound over here, then we can up, uh, upper bound this uh, whole level quantity by the following expression. So that gives us some, uh, some non-trivial bound on, on, on this uh, broad state classical capacity for, for this particular channel. But well, admittedly, this channel is it, it, it's cooked up. It's tailored to the operation that, that we uh, prove this inequality to begin with. OK, so but I think also. Um, well, independently of the information theory, I think this, uh, in some sense, what, um, so maybe if I just uh, go back to this, uh, the, the proof sketch. So what really uh, I think is interesting is, so to prove this inequality for, for large class of functions, what we showed was this, this measurization. But here, there are no functions f. So once we show this, this implies for a bunch of functions, but somehow the interesting thing is really this. And, well, why, and somehow, what this, this, this majorization uh, relation says that this operation has this interesting property. And I think somehow what, what's really interesting maybe is actually this operation itself. And so, so now for the, for the rest of my talk, I will just uh, talk about um, what, what else can we do with this, with this partial swap operation. And uh, in particular, actually just uh, inspired by uh, the, the talks on, on Monday by Robin and um, by Seth Lloyd, I just I want to describe some uh, application for quantum algorithms, and so there was this uh, paper mentioned uh, called uh, "Quantum Principle Component Analysis" by uh, Lloyd, uh, Moxani, and Ravenfrost. And so, it's not important what the uh, what the task is that this algorithm uh, uh, solves, but I just want to show one part of this, which I think is the most interesting part of this algorithm, and this has to do with this partial swap operation. So basically, uh, in their algorithm, they had this uh, this uh, step where given one copy of state sigma and n copies of some other state rho, what, you, what they do is they show how to implement this, uh, basically, evolution according to rho if it would be a Hamiltonian of the state sigma. So you basically, it's in some sense similar to this Hamiltonian uh, evolution that we, we saw on Monday, except uh, in that, for those algorithms, the setup was that it's like a query complexity problem in the sense that you have an oracle that's, that's storing the values of the Hamiltonian, you can query them one by one. 
Well, in this case, you, you get a, a state, a quantum state, that's the density matrix is just equal to the Hamiltonian that you want to apply, and you, you want to basically implement it. And somehow, since you cannot uh, query the entries of this matrix, you perhaps need more copies to be able to do this. So that's, that's the, the task that they, they, they implement. And so, okay, so now, okay, let's, let's look what, what this thing is. So you can write it out like this. So there's uh, some very uh, elegant formula. So if you take some uh, uh, matrix sigma and you conjugate with it to the x and the minus, th minus x, and you tell or expand, you get this nice uh, expansion. So it's just sigma commutator of x and sigma, a double commutator of, of x and sigma, and so on. So you get this, this infinite sequence. And so this already looks a little bit like what we saw in this partial swap. Uh, so in particular, so in, in this case, so let's, let's forgot, forget about this end. Let's say we just have one copy of the state. Then uh, if we plug in x equals to minus uh, i rho tau, then we get something like this. So there are some higher order terms where we have many of these x's. So now if we look at this partial swap operation, so, so I said that you can think of this s also as a Hamiltonian. So if you, if you apply it uh, for some time t, so then you will halfway swap these states. And then the expression that you get is something like this. So it's a convex combination of rho and sigma minus some coefficient times the commutator. And if you expand this uh, in terms of t, uh, the, you compute Taylor expansion. So cosine is just going to contribute to to, uh, to this sigma and, and, and this, this term. Sine squared is just going to contribute only to this term. And then this last one is going to contribute to here. Basically, cosine is going to be 1. And, and sine is going to be like t. So you, you get something like this. So you can see that this, this expansion up to the first uh, two terms agrees exactly with this, what you want to get here. OK? So and now, yeah, so basically, so that's, so if t is very small, then these, these two things are, are essentially the same. Um, and if t is not small, then what you can do, you can just take many copies of your state rho, and you can boost uh, from, from some small t, you can boost to uh, some larger t by just doing this. So you basically. <laughs> You take your uh, sigma and you partially swap with the first copy of rho. Then whatever you get, you partially swap with the second copy of rho and so on. And so if you do this many times, you will just boost this uh, t factor and you will, you will basically get the same expression like this, but except with n t. And that's, that's what we want to get. Okay? So that's, it, it's, it shows that this partial swap somehow is, is a nice thing and it's useful to know and you can use it for, for, for interesting things. And so, okay. So that, that's the partial swap, but then you can ask, well, you know, if you have more than two quantum systems, maybe there are some interest, more interesting ways you can swap them around. And like, for example, if you look at this expression, if you would expand it all the way through, so this, each of these boxes, it's, the, it, it's corresponds to conjugating with some unitary, that's a linear combination of identity and swap. But if you expand all this uh, crazy expression, what you would get is it would be some kind of continuous interpolation when you take uh, sigma and n copies of rho, and then you somehow continuously permute them, depending on what this lambda is. So then basically this brings to up this idea of maybe there is some meaningful uh, way to talk about continuously permuting quantum systems. So that's the last part of my talk. I will just talk about how we can make this rigorous. And I, I just think it's interesting on, on its own. I mean, it, you can, it relates to these entropy power inequalities, but, but these ideas have applications also here. Like for example, you can ask, well, maybe you can do better, like instead of getting this approximation, maybe you can get a better approximation if you, instead of swapping uh, sigma with rho one by one, if you just apply some joint continuous permutation on all these states. So that's, uh, that's an interesting question to ask. Okay, so basically, so then, in other words, what I want to do, I want to just generalize this, this operation to more than two systems. Okay, so then what would this generalization look like? So, so, well, we would just take a bunch of states, and in a similar way, we would just, this would be a part of the state. We apply some joint unitary, and then we throw everything away except the first system. So then we get some state out that has the same dimension as these, all these input states. So in particular, so then our question is, what is, what is this unitary U going to look like? So we, we uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned, so for the case of two systems, uh, I just took this U to be a linear combination of identity and swap, so this particular combination. But, well, you can ask, well, maybe you can take some other linear combination, and if you have uh, more systems, then you can just take the linear combination of all the permutations. 
And so, for example, in this case of two systems, actually you can show that all uh, linear combinations of identity and swap that are unitary, if you want this to be unitary, are actually of, of, of this particular form up to the sign of, of y over here. But so more generally, if you have n systems, then so you have these bunch of qubits and you apply some permutation pi, then uh, you can extend this, this pi to a unitary operator on a big Hilbert space. So this big Hilbert space acts on all these qubits and it's just some huge permutation matrix that just describes how all these systems are permuted around. And so now uh, if we want to permute them continuously, then, then the natural question to ask is when is this linear combination of all these uh, permutation operators unitary? So we just have this uh, linear combination of a bunch of these permutations and we want to know is this unitary or not? And can we characterize these, these complex coefficients uh, z that, that gives unitary matrix? And well, okay, in, in some sense, well, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, interesting or not, but if you remember in Robin's talk, he also mentioned this idea that you, uh, there are certain cases when you want to apply a linear combination of, of uh, unit trees. And well, in this case, this is a un also a linear combination of, of unit trees. These are in particular permutations. I guess in Robin's talk, it was not important that this, is a, this linear combination is unit tree, but if we want to use this formula and get a, a quantum state out, then, then we want to know when this is unit tree. Okay, so uh, to, to answer this question, I'm going to show you some very uh, simple, uh, nice uh, result. Um, so I'm calling it unitary Cayley's theorem. So just uh, to recap, what is Cayley's theorem? So it's this very simple observation that every finite group is isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group of acting on, on n elements, where n is just the size of this, of this finite group. And the reason it's true is, is very simple. So to, what you want, you basically want to represent every element of your group by some permutation matrix of size g by g. And the way you do this, you just assign, I'm just going to denote the cor corresponding permutation matrix by Lg, and it just acts the following way. Uh, you, it acts on a Hilbert space labeled by, uh, by group elements themselves, and you just act by left multiplication. So if you take some standard base vector, you get another one uh, which just corresponds to multiplying g and h together. This is also known as left regular representation of this group. So that's essentially the proof of Kelly's theorem. Um, now, so what I want to do is, so this, this group G is, is in, well, it's, it's just some finite group, it's discrete. But now, when you represent it by these left regular representation, these matrices LG, they have some more structure. So they're, they're actually matrices, and you can take linear combinations of them. And so, so now what I want to ask them is the following question. So the Cayley's theorem basically lets you put your group into a permutation group. But I want to ask, well, can we now take this permutation group and put it into a unitary group? We just want to somehow uh, extend this, uh, this group and continuously be able to interplay between different uh, permutations uh, and just get some group of unitaries. Uh, or in other words, just this is a very similar question that I asked before. Now I'm asking it for specifically for this left regular representation. So you'll, you'll see shortly why I'm interested in, in this one specifically. So what I'm asking is again, so we know that uh, we can represent the group elements by these, these matrices LG, which are permutation matrices, and I'm just asking when is this linear combination of these permutation matrices unitary? Because uh, if it is unitary, then it interpolates in a certain uh, way between uh, these different LGs. And so we kind of, we have made our group uh, continuous. So even if we start with a discrete group, we turn it into a permutation group, and then we, we take linear combinations, we make it, uh, make it continuous. Okay, so that's, that's the question. So when is this uh, linear combination of these left regular representation makes these unitary? And so uh, to answer this, it's, it's extremely useful to, to use a Fourier transform and a representation theory. Um, so just, I will just briefly mention a few facts from representation theory. And so the most important fact is that these matrices LG which are permutation matrices, you can simultaneously block diagonalize them using the Fourier transform for the corresponding group. So for every finite group, there is a certain notion of Fourier transform, and you can uh, block diagonalize them like this. I guess there, we saw some representation theory already today with the sure wild duality. This is in some sense similar. <laughs> so what we have here is a, a big block matrix where the sum is over all irreducible representations of group G, and this is just a representation matrix, and then we have a a large identity matrix, which is the size of the dimension of this representation. <coughs> okay, so now, so this, so they all are of this form in the Fourier basis, but now if we have a linear combination of these matrices, then we can, well, instead of answering when is this linear combination unitary, we can ask 
when is the Fourier transform of this linear combination unitary? So it's just L hat. So this is a linear combination of these uh, L and G hats. And again, so what we get is just uh, these coefficients, we just can pull them in here, and we get a big matrix, that's again a block matrix, and it, it, in each of these blocks we get one of these linear combinations of, of, the, of irreducible representations. And now if we want the whole matrix to be unitary, then in particular we want each block to be unitary. So that's kind of a sufficient condition for this. And it turns out what you can show is that not only this, but uh, you can actually get all possible uh, these UTs. So basically that, um, that this linear combination of these uh, L matrices is going to be unitary if and only if there exists some choice of these U, U taus for each of the blocks uh, such that, uh, well, these coefficients you can explicitly then compute them out. Uh, but basically, it's not only that uh, this is unitary if you can get any unitary in each block, but in fact, for each unitary uh, in these blocks, there is actually a choice of these edges. Or you can just get them by taking essentially Hilbert to make inner product between this thing and this unitary. So that's a, that's a nice result. And I mean, I don't know, maybe this is already known, but uh, well, at least I, I, I'm not aware of this, but if, if somebody knows, it would be interesting to know. And what, this, what, what it characterizes is it characterizes all the linear combinations of, of these LGs that are unitary. So this is, in some sense, a unitary version of the Kelly's. Kelly's theorem. Okay, so now, okay, so why did I work with this left regular representation? So the reason is that in this decomposition it contains all the irreps. So that's a, that's a very standard fact from representation theory. So now, if I know that this is unitary, this particular linear combination with these L, L pi's, so if I now I take this group G to be the specifically symmetric group, then I also get that this is unitary. And the reason is that Whatever these uh, Q pi, so remember these Q pi are the matrices that permute quantum systems. So if you have a bunch of uh, quantum systems, so they just act by permuting them around. And this is a represent representation of a symmetric group. It's just a really huge representation. But whatever this representation is, it breaks down into these irreps tau. And since uh, left regular representation contains all irreps, we know that we are going to get for each irrep, we're going to get this little unitary matrix. And also this one is going to block diagonalize and whatever blocks it's going to have, these blocks are a subset of the blocks for the left of the representation. So that's why we get this, this implication again. All right, so now, uh, okay, so this is all the representation theory, so what, what's the point of all this? So I think, uh, well, now, well, well, now what you can do, you can use this, this result to make this, this notion of continuously permuting systems rigorous. This exactly characterizes what are the allowed linear combinations, and you, you can also check that you can interpolate between different permutations. So, okay, so now I'm just going to stay this, this uh, crazy uh, expression uh, over here. So what you can do, you can just uh, generalize this uh, entropy power inequality for Q this, that I just showed you for more systems. So basically the conjecture for, for specifically for three states would be the following. Again, that we have some concave and symmetric function. Uh, then it satisfies the following inequality, uh, which looks sort of like a concavity of the function f with respect to this uh, crazy operation, which is uh, like a tripartite operation. And you can work out uh, with some f word, you have to contract 36 tensor diagrams and you can get this nice expression. So what, with the first order terms are just convex combination of the states, then the second order terms in rows are just all possible commutators of the three states, and then third order terms are all possible double commutators. So they're just uh, two linear independent double commutators. It looks something like this. And, uh, and these deltas, they have to subject, be subject to these constraints, that they have to sum to zero, and they have to obey this equation, which leaves one degree of freedom uh, that you can still have. Okay, so that's just a crazy expression, but I think what's interesting is that if I would not tell you anything about uh, all these continuous permutations, I would just say this is a quantum state for all row one, row two, row three, and, and probability distributions and deltas subject to these you would think, well, this is totally crazy. And, but, but it turns out this is true, and, um, and that's how it looks like. OK, so um, all right, so these are the results. So I'm going to just briefly state a uh, summary of, of, of what I showed and what are the open problems. So, so again, I think the most important problem, which is, uh, has been around for some time, is the entropy photon number inequality for continuous variable states. And the reason it's important is that it would let you bound uh, uh, ca capacities of, of, of various channels. And so this inequality for this entropy photon number inequality has been actually shown for a special uh, set of states, which are called Gaussian states. But in general, it's, it's not known whether it's true or not. And so sort of 
well, one thing you could uh, think of, well, a very simple thing you could do is you can say, well, okay, so now we proved it for qubits for some finite dimensional states. Why don't we just take a limit of d goes to infinity and perhaps we're going to recover this continuous variable case and all. But, but as, as far as I'm aware, this, this strategy doesn't work. And the reason is simply that this, this partial swap operation that, that I define, it's, I mean, in, some, in a very vague, hand wavy way, it looks kind of like a discrete version of a beam splitter, but, but it's, you, you, I, I don't know how to, I don't think it's possible to make this rigorous. So I mean, maybe it's possible, or, or at least maybe, well, another thing you can say, well, maybe uh, we, we used completely different proof techniques. Our proof was based on majorization, and we didn't use any of the Fisher information and the, the Bruins identity and so on. So there might be some hope to just using, uh, if you can't just take this limit, maybe you can use the proof techniques in some other way. OK, so, well, a variation of this uh, question about entropy power inequalities. What's interesting is there's a version called conditional uh, entropy power inequality. And so for, in a classical case, it's uh, trivial, but uh, for uh, quantum states, it was recently shown by Koenig. And you can also ask whether there's an analog in, in, in finite dimensions, and we have no idea how to prove this. Uh, so then, yeah, so this generalization to three or more systems, so I explain you how you can continuously permute quantum systems around, and I stated this conjecture, how you can conjecture this inequality for three states, and so again, for uh, in a classical case, proving uh, such generalization is trivial. In quantum case, it was recently proved uh, and for continuous variable states. And so I showed how to extend this, this box operation to more states, but, but I have no idea how to prove this entropy for inequality. And the main obstacle is basically that uh, in this expression, you have this, this huge number of these commutators. And the main difficulty in our proof was that for two states, you just have one commutator, and even dealing with that was, was quite hard. But then having this, all this mess of commutators, I don't know how to deal with it. Uh, OK, so that's that. And well, it would be nice to have more applications. So the applications we had was for lower bounding the minimum output entropy of this channel, as well as upper bounding the, the product state uh, classical capacity. But well, admittedly, this application is somewhat contrived because the, the channel is cooked up to, to resemble the partial swap in the first place. But I think also it, it might have applications for quantum algorithms. So I already showed this example with this. Um, from this uh, quantum principle component analysis, but well, perhaps you can swap more than two systems, or I don't know. I mean, there is a swap test that's also widely used, and maybe there is a certain situation when you, when it is desirable to do like a partial swap test, when maybe you don't want to disturb your states by too much. And in Robin's talk, there, he showed you also a trick which was kind of uh, looked somewhat like a partial swap with with uh, with um, with some uh, arbitrary coefficients, but I don't, well, I don't think it's related to, to this one, but, I, but it just might have some applications. And so I think it's worthwhile to, to, to take a note. OK, so I think, I think that's it. So these are the, the two papers that you can take a look at. And the co uh, questions? Okay, then let us thank members again. <laughs>